welcome to Heartlift. I'm Jill Morricone and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. We're in the midst of a journey toward hope, toward healing, toward the transformation that the Lord Jesus wants to work in your heart and in mine as women, as daughters of God. If you're just joining us, we're in the middle of our section on transformation. Last program, we discussed the washed heart, how God wants to wash our heart with the washing of the water of the Word, how the Word of God transforms us. The Word of God empowers us. The Word of God sets us free. Today's program is a pruned heart. Our scripture is in John chapter 15. We're going to spend some time in John 15. John 15 verse 16. The Bible says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Father, I just thank you right now that we didn't choose you. We didn't seek after you. You were the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for choosing us. Thank you for coming after us and for rescuing us from the mire of sin that we are in. Right now, we open up our hearts to receive what you want to share with us from your word, and we thank you. In the precious, in the holy name of Jesus, amen. My husband, Greg, grew up in the hills, in the hollers, in the little mountains of West Virginia. He and his little sister, Janelle, they're a couple years apart. They made mud pies and played in the creek. They climbed up in those hollers and went ginseng and had a wonderful time in the country. Now, one of the things that you know if you grew up um, in the country at all is you would want a swing. Maybe in the city you say, well, I can't, I can't get a swing, I can't get whatever, you know, I don't have any yard. But if you're in the country, you say, I want a swing, a rope swing, a tire swing, something. Well, you know what they had? They had a grapevine swing. What they did, there was a grapevine that was growing on the side of one of the hills, and it went quite a ways all the way up into this tree. In fact, Greg tells me, I asked him the other day, he said that the length of that um, grapevine from the top of the tree where it was hooked in all the way down to the root system, he said was 40 feet. It's pretty long. He said it was only not real thick, but it was very long. What they did is they cut it off at the roots. Then they would jump on it. They would swing out over the valley. They would come back to the little side of the little mountainside. And then the next person, jump on it, swing out, and come back. They did this for some time, and they loved their grapevine swing. Now, you probably know where this story is going. One day, some friends came to visit, and all the kids of the parents, they all got together, the kids, and Greg said they, you know, went out to play. They said, we have got a grapevine swing. you got to try it. So Greg said he jumped on, and he swung out over the field, and he came back showing the other kids, this is what we do. Then a little boy went out, and he said, I'm going to do it. So he jumped on the grapevine, and he swung out over the field, and it broke. And he went flying, and he hit a stump. Not a very big stump, but a little stump. And it knocked the breath out of him. Praise the Lord that he was not injured. So that is a big praise the Lord for that. When I think of that story, why did the grapevine break? You know why it broke? because it was disconnected from its source down in the bottom. It was disconnected from its root system, from its nutrient system, from the water. And the grapevine, it eventually, it rotted. Eventually, it broke. John chapter 15, we want to look at the first five verses here in John chapter 15. We're talking about the vine. We could say grapevines, but in this case, it, it is the vine. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, 
he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That's our word for today. He prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. I'm in verse 3. Now you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. He says, stay connected to that root system. Otherwise, we're going to break. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, unless you abide in me. Verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We abide in Jesus in order to produce fruit. We abide in Jesus in order to remain leafy and green and to keep from rotting and breaking off. We abide, we abide in Jesus. Notice it said, he, the, the branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bring forth more fruit. We're talking today about the process of pruning. I have over here on my little desk a pair of Greg's pruning shears. I don't know if you can see my pruning shears here. These pruning shears work specifically, this is not for clipping grass. This is specifically cutting trees, clipping, pruning. If you're trying to prune a tree, maybe a fruit tree, maybe an apple tree, something like that. What is the purpose of pruning? We're going to discuss six purposes of pruning and then we'll get briefly into the process. What is the purpose of pruning? If you had, say, an apple or a peach or a pear or some type of tree or an oak, what would be the purpose of pruning? Number one, it's to remove the bad. Remove the bad. If you prune a tree, it removes the dead, diseased, or the broken limbs. You know what? In my heart, God says, Jill, I want to prune your pride or your condemnation and your shame. I want to prune your bitterness and your inability to forgive someone else. I want to prune your anger and your fear and your lust, your sadness, your shame. I want to take off those things that are keeping you from bearing abundant fruit. Now, who prunes us? Who does the pruning? I think we're pruned through several different aspects. The first, we're pruned, God prunes us. We're pruned through the work of God. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm jumping over here to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says, verse 11. I like it in NIV. I'm going to read it in that version. No discipline, or we could say pruning, seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Nevertheless, later... It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Later, the discipline isn't pleasant, it isn't good, but later it's going to produce a harvest of righteousness and of peace. I can think of in my own life times when I've gone through painful experiences and I thought, God, I have no idea what's going on. And he said, just trust me. Trust me, in the midst of this, I'm breaking off a little diseased limb over here, and I'm taking off something that's broken here because I want to make you whole. I want to make you whole. Not only does God prune, but also our choices prune. What do I mean by that? Galatians 6, verse 7 talks about we sow what we, we reap what we sow. Whatever we sow, if we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap of the flesh. If we sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap of the Spirit. We reap whatever we sow. God can overturn those consequences, and I believe that with all my heart. Joel 2, 25, he tells us, I will redeem, God speaking, I will redeem the years that the locust has eaten. And then he goes through the different types, but he's just saying, I'm going to redeem. I'm going to redeem your past. Whatever those issues are, whatever that pain is, I'm going to redeem that. However, sometimes we still face some of those consequences. Remember David in his sin with Bathsheba. God forgave him 
Absolutely. Even after the sin, God said he was a man after God's own heart. God used um, Solomon to become the next king, and Solomon was the fruit of he and Bathsheba's union. However, there was still consequences that did remain. Remember, he lost sons. There was uh, disunity in the royal family. Absalom died. There was other pain, other son's death because of that. Now we know God prunes sometimes. If we're in a trial, if we're in a painful place, why is this happening? Maybe it's God doing something in my life. Maybe it's a consequence or a result of choice. Maybe it's simply neither. It's the result of sin. It's the result of the sinful world that we live in. However, God can still work out whatever it is. He can still work it out for good. I think of the story of Joseph. Remember, he was sold as a slave by his own brothers. And then years later, he saw his brothers and he forgave them. But yet, when their father died, the brothers were still a little nervous. Oh, maybe now Joseph is going to revenge upon himself. You know what we did to him all those years before. They were nervous. And Joseph said to them in Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. Romans 8, 28 holds true all the time. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Of course, it doesn't mean that all things are good. It doesn't mean that the trials that are in your life as a result of just the world of sin we live in, it doesn't mean that that is good. But you know what it means? It means that God can and he will work all those things out for our good. So number one, God prunes, or our choices are the results of sin, but the pruning happens to remove the dead or the diseased limbs. Number two, it opens us up for light. First John, turn with me over to first John. If you prune a tree, it opens up the tree canopy for more light from the sun to penetrate down in and to filter in. Light is essential for flower bud development and optimal fruit flavor and quality. Pruning likewise opens up our own hearts to receive more of the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, into our hearts and lives. In addition, pruning enables us to walk with each other in fellowship. This is our verse in 1 John 1, verse 5 through 7. Not only does pruning open us up to receive light from God, it opens us up to receive more fellowship with each other. The Bible says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that, we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What is John saying here? If we walk in the light, if we walk in Jesus, we're going to have closer fellowship with each other. Pruning opens up my heart to receive more of Jesus, and it also opens up my heart so that I can uh, fellowship, be in closer bond and unity with my brothers and sisters. Pruning also enables me to witness more effectively for Jesus. I believe witnessing is a direct outgrowth of the light of God shining into my heart and into my life. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 3. Whoops, I almost had it there. I like this promise. There we go. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's the light we're talking about, the light from Jesus. For darkness covers the earth. And you know, in the world we live in, there's a lot of darkness and gross darkness, deep darkness, the people. But the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be sh seen in you. Verse three is the, the crucial one. Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. 
You know what it says? Verse 3 comes after verse 1 and 2. After the glory of the Lord has shone into my heart and into my life, you know what's going to happen? Other people are going to take notice that you and I have been with Jesus. Witnessing opens us up to receive more of Jesus from above. It opens us up to walk in greater fellowship with our brothers and sisters. It also opens us up to shine, to be a greater witness. Number one, pruning removes the bad. Number two, pruning opens us up for light. Number three, pruning opens us up for air. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is a story of Nicodemus. If in the physical world we say pruning opens up the tree for air, what does that mean? It promotes rapid drying of the leaves and that minimizes disease infection. So when we say it opens it up, it can get more air through the tree and that minimizes the risk of disease. Pruning allows the Holy Spirit to work more freely in your life and in mine. Remember in John chapter 3, Nicodemus went to go see Jesus by night because he was afraid. He was afraid of what the rulers of the Sanhedrin would think, what the Pharisees would think if he went to go see Jesus by day. So he went by night. In John chapter 3 verse 8, we find the Bible saying here, Jesus had said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, I have no idea how to do that. And Jesus said, marvel not that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You notice how Jesus connects the wind. The, it's imperceptible, unless it's really blowing, but we don't see it. We see its effects. We see the leaves as they rattle, as they move. You might see if it's a hurricane, phew, whole trees bent over. It depends. You can feel if it's a light breeze, you could feel the wind on your face. If it's a strong breeze, you can really feel it. You can feel the effects, but we cannot see the wind. So with the work of the Holy Spirit, we see the effect. We see the effect of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We can't see Him, but you can definitely see when He is working in someone's heart and in someone's life. John 20, verse 22. Remember, it says, Jesus breathed on them, and He said, Receive the Holy Ghost. There again, the Holy Spirit is connected with air. So first, we prune to remove the bad. Second, we prune to open up for light. Third, we prune to open up for air. Fourth, we prune to open up for, you could say water or a pesticide spray. Now, we're not getting into organics, so I'm just using this as an illustration, okay? I'm not saying GMO, non, or pesticide, whatever. But it opens up the tree, so you can get more of that inside, whether it's water, whether it's pesticide spray. It allows the spray to penetrate all the areas of the tree. Pruning allows the Word of God to wash us. We talked last program about the washing of the water of the Word. That's Ephesians 5, 26. And how God wants to wash us. He wants to cleanse us through His Word. Hebrews 4, 12, our last program, we discussed that a little bit. Hebrews 4, verse 12. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sometimes in my own experience, ah, if I read the Word of God and it starts to cut me, I shy away. I don't want anything to do with that because it hurts. But if you read a passage and you feel the cutting of the Word of God, study that passage more. Don't shy away from it. Get into that passage. Number five, pruning grows more fruit even faster. If you prune a tree in the physical world, you're going to get a higher quality fruit and it's going to come earlier. Likewise, when God prunes you and I, it yields more 
fruit, when even the consequences of our choices or the result of sin in this world prunes you and I. God can still overturn that in order to yield more fruit in our life. John 15, verse 2, Jesus says, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's what the Lord Jesus wants to work in your life and in mine. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Hudson Taylor, the Christian author, missionary, said this, fruit bearing involves cross bearing. Fruit bearing involves cross bearing. In other words, sometimes it's very painful Sometimes pruning hurts, absolutely it hurts. But in the midst of that, God is, going, God is growing more fruit in my heart and in my life. First, God prunes us to remove the bad. Second, he prunes us to open up for light. Third, he prunes us to open up for air. Fourth, for that spray. Number five, to grow more fruit faster. And number six, for a beautiful life now. I think about a well-shaped tree. It's very aesthetically pleasing. Would you agree with me? It looks nice, the shape is nice. Pruning enables us to look more like Jesus, to be beautiful on this earth and in the earth made new. Those were the six purposes of pruning. Now what about the process? What if you're in the midst of being pruned now and you say, Jill, I hurt. What am I supposed to do with this? Two points I want you to remember in closing. First, surrender. Surrender gives God permission to come in, even in the midst of that pain, and to work. Surrender is simply choosing God's way every time I'm faced with a decision. Just saying yes to Jesus every time I'm faced with that. What does God ask me to surrender? Number one, my way my will, my selfishness, my pride, my bitterness, my anger, my fear, my shame, sometimes my entertainment, my choices in entertainment, my choice of friends, it might even be where I work, who I marry, where I live. God asks us to surrender this so that the pruning process can be effective in your life and in mine. Number two, as we look at the process of pruning, is to accept the trial with joy. Accept the trial with joy. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. He says, My brethren, count it joy. And when I read that, I think, God, how could I even do that? Count it joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count the trial as joy. Can we do that? Absolutely not in our own strength. But we can go to God and we can say, God, in the midst of this pain, in the midst of whatever I'm dealing with right now, I choose to trust you. I choose to surrender my way to you. I choose to give thanks. Remember we talked about walking by faith, not by how we feel. I choose to give thanks and know that you're going to bring joy. You're going to bring deliverance. You're going to bring a beautiful fruit in your time. In just a moment, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we want to do our practical application for this week. Welcome back. We talked today about the process of pruning. I know that pruning is painful and pruning is definitely not pleasant, but it produces in you and in me an abundant harvest of righteousness and of peace. It produces more fruit. It opens our hearts up to receive more of Jesus, more of the air, the Holy Spirit, more of the washing of the water of the Word. That is a beautiful thing. At the end, it's a beautiful experience. 
I have here my journal open before me, and for this week, what I would encourage you to do is to take your journal and to write down three different things. Number one, what area of my life is God pruning right now? Go to God and ask. You might already know. In the past, one of the programs in the past, I shared with you, Greg and I, our own struggle with infertility. So I put that down as number one. It might not be for you. Whatever it is for you, you put it down. That might be my trial or my struggle, infertility. Then figure out what is God asking you to surrender? What does he want you to surrender? For us, it was surrender the desire for kids. Surrender the desire to be um, parents, to have that. Then look at the end result. What good could come out of that? What is God trying to work? In our experience, it gave us more time to devote to ministry. It gave us more empathy with other people. It developed in me a closer walk with God and an even tighter relationship with my husband. But maybe that's not your battle. Maybe my next point here, maybe it's a child who's left Jesus. And God says, surrender my control over their choices. Surrender your control over their choices. What could God work out of that? Maybe deeper faith and trust in Jesus, a stronger prayer life, more empathy with other people who suffer. Maybe a decision to follow Jesus regardless of even if my kids do, I'm following Jesus regardless. Maybe more doors open to ministry to other people in similar circumstances. Whatever it is, identify what God is asking you to surrender. Surrender that to Him and try to look ahead and see what God is working in your heart and in your life. Our next program has to do with the Spirit-filled heart. As always, in conclusion, our scripture is Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.